Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. And uh, we're going to be talking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We're here to uh, break bread in his memory and his honour. And really, to think about the resurrection is, of course, appropriate. And we're going to be looking at John chapter 20. We're not going to have anyone read it this time. I'm going to read it to you, but uh, as it were, give the, uh, give the midrash as we, uh, as we go through. But to start with, let's, uh, let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you, whatever we are in the world, in whatever situations we find ourselves in, whatever part of our journey towards your kingdom we are on, we come to you, Heavenly Father, seeking for your blessing as we focus our hearts briefly upon your Son and his resurrection. And Father, quite rightly, has he been exalted by you to your right hand and has been established as Prince of the Kings of the Earth, Father, because he was worthy. And we are here, Father, to add our voices and our hearts in praise to him and to you for all that you have done for us, for all your grace, for your passionate desire to save us. We pray, Father, that your word might live for us as we read it, that we might hear your voice to us. Father, we pray for all those who are in particularly difficult situations at this time. We think of those who are persecuted for their faith at the hands of extremists. We think of those who are trapped in poverty. We think of those suffering natural disasters. We think of those who are facing terminal illness, who are facing other forms of debilitating handicap or, or difficult physical situations. Those, Father, who are in very difficult family situations, those who suffer abuse. We think of those who are locked into a pattern of sin and weakness and failure. We pray, Father, that in all these situations, your spirit and your way and the simple love of your Son might break through and that in your light we might see light. And we pray, Father, then, that you will guide each of us who are participating at this time and those near and dear to us that at the end of all things, when all is said and done, by your great grace, may each of us live forever in your kingdom, because, Father, truly that is all our hope and all our desire. Father, that is the passion of our lives, held back, admittedly, by our weakness, by our failure, by our humanity. But all the same, Father, you know that that is how it is, that we love his appearing. And we pray, therefore, that he will come soon and that we will do what we're going to do now, taking the, the bread and wine and his memory in far greater glory at his table in his kingdom. And we pray that you will hasten it in its time. For his sake. Amen. Right, so John chapter 20. As I said, we won't be uh, getting anyone to read this. I, I'm going to read it through and then, as I say, add my little midrash. So... John 20, first day of the week, comes Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and sees the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And we take that to be John, the author of this gospel, a typical sort of uh, self-effacement, not mentioning his name, not talking about me, me, me. And she says, they've taken away the Lord. If you go to verse 17... The Lord says to Mary, as the first person to have seen the risen Lord, Go and tell my brethren. Go to my brethren, go to my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. So he chose her, Mary Magdalene, as the first witness. Now, that's interesting because under Roman law and under Jewish law, a woman was not a witness. A woman could not be a credible witness, especially if she were alone. And she was alone and a woman. We look back a bit at her life. I mean, she'd been a prostitute, right? Let's get that straight. And she also was the woman out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons, which we understand to mean that she had been mentally ill. That's not a very solid witness. Somebody who has got a history of mental illness 
someone who's a woman in that context, and someone who, unfortunately, didn't have a great biography. I mean, she, she'd been a prostitute, right? And Jesus chooses her, and he chooses her as the sole witness to be the very first one to see him and to go and tell men, my brothers, males, about his resurrection. Well, do you feel inadequate for the work of witness? If you're humble, if you're genuine, of course you do. We all do. Who am I? That I should tell anyone, that I should be part of God's purpose and God's program in saving other people. Who am I? Who am I? Duncan, who are you? Whoever you are, who are you? Svetlana. Via. David. Who are you? Who am I? And it is our inadequacy which is in fact our qualification. I'll say that again. It's our inadequacy. That's our qualification. Because he chooses this person, this woman, this ex-prostitute, this person with a history of mental illness, that she, with those major drawbacks, is to be the witness, the primary first witness. And this is typical of how God works. This is his style. It's the style of his son. It's his personal style to use the weak, to use those who are not at all qualified. That's his way. So don't think that you don't have a part, that you are not qualified, that who am I? Oh, well, I don't know my verses, as people tell me. Oh, I couldn't do that. I, I don't know my, my Bible verses. Or somebody says, well, I couldn't, you know, I, I'm uh, undivorcedly married. Or someone says, well, I, I can't because, you know, I, I'm, I'm living with someone, and we, you know, we're not married and all that. Or somebody says, well, you know, I'm a smoker. Or somebody says, well, you know, I've got a problem with alcohol or with drugs or whatever it might be. Or I've got a stutter. These things are your qualification because this is how God works. This is his absolute hallmark. So, she's the one who is chosen. And she says, they've taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. Do you know what? She's the first person to call Jesus the Lord. He was exalted to God's right hand to be Lord and Saviour. And she's the first one who joins the dots and gets it. They've taken away the Lord, and we don't know where they've laid him. Three. Peter, therefore, went forth. In the old days, when we used to uh, not have tablets and things like that, we used to have hard copy Bibles, didn't we? And uh, I can remember taking my pen out and putting a circle around the word therefore. Peter therefore went forth. Well, why? Because he believed this female witness, whom the others said, well, you know, she's crazy. You know, she's like, you know, had seven demons cast out of her. You know, she's got a history of mental illness. It's a bit like saying, well, <laughs> you know, she's been in and out of uh, uh, mental institutions for all her life. Uh, yeah, but he all the same believed her. He had that humility. And they came to the sepulchre. And that other disciple, this is John, and they ran both together. And the other disciple, John, outran Peter. And he came first to the sepulchre. He, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, but he didn't go in. And then comes Simon Peter, panting, we imagine, uh, then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and sees the linen clothes lie, etc. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre and he saw and believed. Well, is this John saying, yeah, I, I was, uh, I'm stronger than uh, Peter, I'm in better health, uh, I'm not not put on as many kilos as he did, I ran, and do you know what, I, I outran him. No. The whole spirit of this narrative is of men and women being awed into grateful humility by the whole experience of the Lord's resurrection, and that is the takeaway that we should each have. So when John says, well, I ran faster, and I outran Peter, but he went in uh, at first, and he was the first one to see. I think it's his humility, not his arrogance, that he ran faster. He's saying, yeah, yeah, I could run faster. I was physically in a bit better nick than, uh, than Peter, but he had more insight and more faith and more bravery and courage 
than I had. So all the way through the account, we get the impression of humility. Well, he records how they saw the napkin that had been about the Lord's head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And how they saw the linen clothes lying. You remember in the record of the Lord's embalming, it says that they used myrrh. Well, myrrh glues linen to the body. Once that has been applied, there is no way that the person can, of themselves, get out of it. The myrrh glues the linen to the body in a very, very strong bond. And so that's why they were very struck about the way the linen clothes were lying, wrapped up nicely, and the, nap and the napkin was neatly wrapped in a place by itself. I think as with the crucifixion, so with the resurrection, we each have a solemn duty before God and before the Lord Jesus to try to reconstruct in our own minds what happened. And we may get it wrong, but let's try. It would have been absolute silence. Dark, a bit wet, damp kind of tomb uh, in the rock. Absolute silence. And then a rustle, a rustling sound and a a collapsing sound, that's how I imagine it, as those grave clothes that, humanly speaking, were glued to the Lord's skin by the myrrh, fell away from him. And he stands up. And what does he do? He wraps neatly his grave clothes and puts them to one side. He was immortal. He had risen from the dead. Sin and death had been busted and broken for all time. And the first thing he does, as I imagine it, is to, well, to do what he'd probably done as a child, waking up, uh, yeah, fold up my bedclothes neatly and put them away. And that's what he did. And you see there, and we're going to talk about this later, his humanity even after his resurrection and glorification. And I love that. This is why in 1 Timothy 2.5 we read, after the Lord's resurrection, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So he can still be called the man, even in his heavenly glory, even having divine nature. He doesn't want us to lose the idea that he is with us and that he absolutely identifies with human beings. So, in my little reconstruction, there was this noise, and the slight noise of a man standing up, and he wraps up these clothes. And later on, we're going to see that, in verse 15, that when he walks out into the early morning light with the uh, the lights of Jerusalem shimmering in the distance, everybody else getting up after the, uh, after the holiday, back to work, looking after the animals, sorting them out, getting the kids ready. Nobody really realised the wonderful thing that had happened, that the Son of God had risen from the dead. And when Mary first sees him, glances at him, she thinks he's the gardener. Well, why would she think he was a gardener? Because he was dressed like a gardener. So, in my little reconstruction, he resurrects, the grave clothes fall off, he wraps them neatly, and, oh, some gardener has left his clothes there. Well, without getting inappropriate, I suppose the Lord didn't have any clothes uh, to put on, and, oh, some gardener guy has just left his, left his working clothes there. I guess he was pottering around and, uh, well, yeah, just left his clothes and... Uh, in this uh, new grave that had been cut out, it would be the logical place for a gardener to, to leave his working clothes, would it not? And so the Lord put them on. And I love that, because the, the whole picture that you get in, let's say, Russian Orthodoxy, certainly in Catholic Church, um, of Jesus in sort of shining white clothes with bright blonde hair and blue eyes and glory as a halo all around him. No. 
he was not looking like that because Mary would not have thought he was the gardener, would she? So, you see that God and Jesus have a kind of humility about them. And I find that very compelling and very attractive. So, where are we up to? Uh, verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Well... Yeah, they knew not the scripture, but Jesus had told them multiple times that he was to be crucified and after three days rise again. They should have all been there expecting to see the risen Jesus, but they weren't. And this is why he castigates them very strongly. The son of God with eyes as a flaming fire now, after his resurrection in one sense, uh, dressed down his disciples. He got that in Matthew, got it in Mark very clearly, that he rebukes them. You fools and slow of heart to believe, Luke as well. Uh, to, you fools, you, you're, you were so slow to believe the obvious. So when John says they did not know the scripture, he means knowing in the Hebraic sense. They didn't recognize, they didn't discern, they didn't perceive the scripture. So all through the gospel records, the writers are admitting their own slowness to believe. And when you think, well, what were the gospel records? How did they come about? I would say that they were the transcripts of how those men first preached the gospel. The gospel of Matthew would have been the story that Matthew usually told people. And then, under inspiration, it was written down and recorded. Uh, and same with John. He, his gospel is clearly aimed at Jewish people, and he therefore would have come out with this in his ministry to the Jews and his preaching, and as he got older, under inspiration, it was written down. And that's what we have. And yet all of the Gospel writers are very full of the idea that we were so dumb, we were so slow to believe this, but you, my hearers, please believe it. And so, verse 8, uh, the other disciple, John, who came first to the sepulchre, saw and believed. But in verse 31, he concludes this chapter by saying, These signs are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you might have life. So he's saying, look, I was terribly slow to believe this, and I'm preaching this to you, but I urge you to be quicker than I was, and to get it. I saw and I believed, and I'm telling you this, but I ask you to also see what I'm saying, and to believe it. So, this is the basis for powerful witness, it seems to me. It is admitting our own weakness, and not coming over like, I've got all the answers, let me just correct you on this point, and let me correct you on that point. That's, that's not attractive to people, and very few people are going to say yes to that. It is our own humanity and weakness which becomes attractive, and you're asking people to believe what you yourself have struggled to believe, although you do believe it now. And that's, I think, what's going on here in the Gospels. 11. Mary stood outside of the sepulchre, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. It's a bit like the cherubim, isn't it? With the wings of the cherubim over the ark, and the blood particularly on the mercy seat, which was like the, the cover of the ark. And they say to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus says unto her, Woman, why do you weep? Who do you seek? She, supposing him to be the gardener, says to him, Sir, if you've carried him from here, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus says unto her, Mary. She turned herself and says to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. So she turned herself twice. The angels say, he's not here. And she's not frankly interested in whether they're angels or who these people are, because she's so focused upon Jesus. 
she turns away from them and she sees Jesus. And she thinks he's the gardener. And she turns away from him. And then Jesus says, Mary. And she turns and looks at him again. That's, I think, what happened. And I repeat again that when she first clapped eyes on Jesus, on the risen Jesus, she thinks he is the gardener because he's dressed as a working man. No shining garments, no halo of glory around his head, not at all. This is the stuff of church tradition. The biblical record, as you see, is quite different. There was a humility in Jesus, absolute humility, that, and in God as well. I mean, God doesn't sort of trumpet his son, da, 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 here he is, you beat him up, you crucified him, and now he's justified and resurrected. No. He, he resurrects, as I've suggested, and then he dresses, I suggested, in the clothes of a gardener that had just been left in this new empty tomb, the logical place for a working man to leave his working togs, uh, I'd say overnight, it would have been over the, uh, the whole Passover holiday period. And Jesus dresses himself in them. But it's when he says Mary that she turns, that this is him. It's just one word, Mariam, I guess was the word he said. But the point is that his pronunciation, his accent, his intonation, after his resurrection was exactly the same to the word and to the letter as it had been before his resurrection. So when she's not even looking at him and he says, Mariam, that's, the, that's Jesus, that's his voice, and she, she turns immediately. Jesus Christ, Paul says in Hebrews, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think one dimension of that is that who he was in essence before his death is who he was afterwards, even though he's now glorified and has got divine nature. He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus whom we meet in the Gospels is the Jesus with whom we have to do today, and this is the Jesus whom we shall meet at the Day of Judgment. In other words, he is not going to turn another side. You know how it is, you think you know somebody, and then, oh man, they turn another side, you think, well, oh, I thought I knew you, but now I, now I do know you. It's not going to be like that with him. The Jesus that we have encountered in the Gospels, the Jesus who loved little children, the Jesus who literally died to save people, who felt absolutely at home with sinners, the Jesus who hated Pharisaism and hypocrisy, especially in a religious sense, that's the Jesus we deal with today, and it's the same Jesus you're going to meet at the Day of Judgment. And going further, I think from that, you can also deduce, fair enough, that Although we shall be changed, and, you know, we shall be changed, we shall be like him, we also, in essence, will be the same then as we are now, insofar as salvation is personal. I, Duncan, you, whoever you are, as the sum of all my little experiences in life that builds and forges a character and a personality, that's me. Um... I will be saved. You will be saved. This is the whole idea of personal salvation. And, of course, that highlights the huge importance of spiritual mindedness, of character development. Because who we are now, in essence, is who we shall eternally be. Now, this is critically important, then. It's not that we're suddenly going to be zapped into being somebody else. That wouldn't be personal salvation, would it? And it would also sort of show in that case that sort of personal personality, character, etc. Is, is not particularly important. And it is. You know, to be spiritually minded is absolutely critical to God's whole way of, of behaving. So, Jesus says to her, 17, Touch me not. The idea is, stop clinging onto me. She obviously thought, oh, he's resurrected. He's going to be going to heaven now. Don't go just yet. He says, no, don't keep grabbing hold of me. It's okay. Because I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers 
Um, I spoke earlier about how she was the most, humanly speaking, unqualified person to be chosen as the primary witness. She was a woman, and women had no legal power as witnesses in Jewish or Roman law. She was a former prostitute, and she was the woman out of whom the Lord had cast seven demons. She had a history of mental illness, and of course, when she does come to them uh, and say, oh, he's risen, they like, uh, you're having another, f uh, like another one of your fits, you're having one of your bad turns, right? Yeah, you, you're crazy. But no, she's the one. And as soon as you think that you are not quite qualified uh, to be a witness, to go and talk to anyone about Jesus, well, you are. And it is your sense of inadequacy, which is your adequacy in that, uh, in that sense. Well, he says, I ascend to my father and your father, and to my God and your God, and go and tell my brothers this. Now, this is not only a big nail in the coffin of Trinitarian thinking. There's no way that the risen Jesus can talk about my God and, as your God and my father as your father. I mean, it is that. It's a big, huge problem for Trinitarianism. But I think more to the point, he is saying to them, uh, go to my brothers. I don't want you to think that because I have now resurrected and I've got divine nature that I'm sort of not one of you anymore. I am with you. You are my brothers and my God is your God and my father is your father, even though I've got divine nature. And he is actually quoting here from the Septuagint of Ruth 1 verse 16. Remember the story there, there's Ruth, the girl from Moab, and she's desperate that Naomi, her former mother-in-law, because her husband has died, uh, allows her to go with her to Israel and to basically become a proselyte. And Ruth says to Naomi, your people shall be my people and your God will be my God. She's saying, okay, I admit, there's differences between us. I am a Moabitess and you are a Hebrew, but all the same, that does not affect our relationship because we have the same common relationship to the same God, the God of Israel. And Jesus is quoting this and he's saying, look, um, there, are, there are differences. I've got divine nature and you haven't, but don't let that get in the way. Don't let that make you think that I don't understand you. And I mentioned before, 1 Timothy 2.5, we now have a mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And he has this title, the man, right now, after his glorification. So he is not far from us. Don't think that, well, he's, he's got divine nature now, it's okay for him now. Yeah, that is so, but this is not a barrier. He emphasizes this. And... Just if I may branch out of John 20 and shoot over to the next chapter, John 21, verse 5. They're in Galilee, uh, on the Lake of Galilee, fishing, and Jesus is alone on the land, and he shouts out to them. The AV says, children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, no. Now, when you read all these learned uh, expositors who try to struggle with the Greek word paidon, which is translated their children, and as some versions say boys. But I think that the real sense of it is, and the difficulty for the translators, is that this is slang. This is slang. To translate it dynamically, it would be at best guys, more like fellas, Fellas, you got any food? You catch anything, guys? And why the translators in their sort of, you know, ivory tower, uh, middle-class academia way sort of struggle with this is because it just seems inappropriate that the risen Son of God should stand by a lake in Galilee and shout out to the disciples, guys, fellas, huh? you got any food? that this isn't quite what we expect of the risen Son of God. But why he uses this word, I think, is the same reason why he says, uh, go and tell my brothers that my Father is your Father and my God is your God. He's saying, look, I, I'm, I'm still with you. I'm one with you. Even though, okay, I've got divine nature. Okay, 
I understand. But I don't want you, I'm desperate actually, that you don't think that you can't relate to me. You can. And this is a wonderful, wonderful message for us. Absolutely wonderful. So, where are we up to? 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. She has the guts to do this. She believes that Jesus has entrusted her with this message, though she'd have been thinking, oh, can't she get someone else? Why do you choose me as the first witness? I'm not credible. Okay, but she believed it. And she accepted the Lord's trust as we should. <clears throat> and then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled or synagogued, they'd now started their own synagogue, as it were, of fearful, uh, frightened, weak-faithed men. <clears throat> The doors were shut where the disciples were assembled or, or synagogued for fear of the Jews. Then Jesus came and stood in the midst and says to them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed them his hands and his side, and then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now, if this was written by anything other than divine inspiration, there would be a great big thing about how they felt and lots of adjectives, but just says they were glad. It's beautiful, really. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Well, I think that that is John's version of the Great Commission. Matthew, Mark and Luke all have him telling the disciples, Right, I've risen from the dead, now go and preach this to everybody. And in fact, John's Gospel repeats what you've got really in the Matthew, Mark and Luke Gospels, but it, okay, in a different sort of way. I mean... Classic one would be Matthew, Mark and Luke talk about the birth of Jesus, or sorry, Matthew and Luke do. Uh, they talk about the birth of Jesus, uh, Mary, shepherds and so on. Uh, John does, but he just says, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was made flesh. It's often been said that uh, John doesn't talk about the, the breaking of bread. Well, he does, but in John 6, when Jesus takes the bread and breaks it and gives it to the crowd, then quite clearly... John sees that as the breaking of bread. And so this, I think, is his equivalent of the Great Commission. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained or loosed. That's fairly hard to understand that. But once you accept that this is a reference to the Great Commission, to go and preach the gospel to the whole world, as the Father sent me, so now I'm sending you, well then it makes sense because it shows the power that is in the message that we hold in our hands. If you give someone the message of forgiveness and redemption and they accept it, well then you've given them remission of sins. If they refuse it, well... Uh, their sins shall remain with them, thanks to you having preached to them and them having rejected it. And uh, I think there's similar ideas in Matthew 16 when Jesus talks about giving the keys of the kingdom. And the keys of the kingdom are, are the gospel. And if you give somebody the gospel, you give them the key to get into the kingdom. That is the power, then, of our preaching that really we can unlock the kingdom for people. And we have been sent, and we therefore have in our, in our hands the opportunity for human forgiveness. Let's use it. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, the twin, or the doubter, the man of two minds, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. Like children, aren't they? And I think that's the, you know, the thing that it sounds like the kids. Oh, we saw Jesus and you didn't. Uh, that's intentional because, as I said, John is writing this to point out and to highlight his own immaturity and then to round up uh, at the end of the, uh, the chapter by saying, now you do better than me. You, my hearers, you, my audience, you do better than I did, please. You believe this quicker than I did and more deeply than I did and not in such a childish way but in a more mature way. But Thomas said to them, Unless I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, 
and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, of course, the spear would have left a mark, a gash in his side that was big enough for a hand to go in, whereas the nails would have left a, a mark that was big enough just for one finger to go in. So again, you see how the biblical record in, it, in the little details is absolutely consistent. It's psychologically credible. It's physically credible. It is that internal harmony that for me is by far the biggest evidence that the Bible is inspired. So, Jesus still had the marks in his body from the nails and from the spear thrust. This is after he has risen from the, from the dead. This is after he has been glorified. This is after he has been given God's nature. Well, I, again, I see in this evidence that Jesus wants to show us that even though I am not of your nature now, and I have made it, as it were, and you're still on the way there, you haven't got there yet, I don't want that to be a barrier between us, please. Well, of course, he didn't need to have those marks in his hands and in his side. They could have all been miraculously cured. But they weren't. Because he so wanted to show them that this is me. And that although I have divine nature, I am not separate from you. As I say, 1 Timothy 2.5, the man Christ Jesus. After eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here your finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither your hand. This had to be a bigger thing to get into the gash left by the spearhead. Reach hither your hand, and thrust it into my side. And don't be faithless, but believe in him. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Well, there's no way that this, this can mean that Jesus is God himself in person. There is only one God, and that is the Father, and Jesus is the Son of God. And we've just mentioned in verse 17, I ascend to my Father, who is your Father, to my God, who is your God. Well, God himself isn't going to talk about my God, is he? So how do we understand that? Well, they lived in the time of the Roman Empire. And if you were to translate that phrase into Latin, which was the language of the empire, it would have been Dominus et Deus. Uh, Dominus Master, Deus et, and Deus God. And on everything, on the coins, on the public buildings, it was written about Caesar. Dominus et Deus Noster. In other words, our Lord and our God, Caesar. That was the title of Caesar. And he was the only Lord and the only God. They lived at the time of the cult of Caesar. And I think one reason then why Thomas maybe didn't want to believe was it was going to get him into trouble with the authorities, with the Romans. They, after all, had allowed the crucifixion of Jesus. And now he's saying, no, he, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God, not Caesar. That is a rejection of the cult of Caesar. And we also live in a society which in different ways, but all the same, is basically the cult of the worship of the flesh and of sin. And to break apart from that and to say, no, I will not have a part in this. I don't want to be part of this sinful system of things. That's the same radical feeling that Thomas had, that no, I'm out of this. My Lord and my God is not Caesar. It's going to be Jesus. And so Jesus is alive. He has risen. And as I said, I invite you to reconstruct in your own minds his resurrection. He did this for you. And he stands before us in our own minds, in our own imagination, uh, real. And he is real. Jesus is real. Simple as that. And there should be that same response. My Lord and my God. No, I'm not going to have Caesar and this world as my Lord and my God, but only him. 
Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And I guess he had us in view. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the believing you might have life through his name. And I've said that earlier, John has been saying, I saw and I believed. And now he wraps up by saying, I want you who are listening to me to also see and believe. But do it better than I did. Be quicker to get it than I was. And so, what can we say? We come closer now to the breaking of bread. We come closer to him there on the cross, to him risen again. And we do this, as I say, in absolute honour of him, and yet aware very much that we are called to respond. One cannot be passive before him. You cannot be passive before this kind of wonder of the resurrection of the Son of God. And so Jesus says in John 6, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness of the dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed. This is the true food. Nothing out there in the world is the same as this. My flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. Let's give thanks then for the, uh, for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for him. We thank you for his love, for his self-sacrifice. And we pray, Father, that truly he might abide in us and that we might abide in him. And that truly all this shall be true for me and that I shall live forever with him and with you and with all those who have truly loved you and believed in him for eternity. For his sake. Amen.